today for registration. This? Oh. So this room holds. You put that in the in the. Fifty, I think, holds. So I'll we'll assume point. that we've got Jersey traffic <laughs> happening this morning. We have lots of friends and colleagues joining you throughout the day. Okay, welcome. My name is Jennifer Coffey. I'm the executive director of ANDAC. I see is lots of faces that I recognize, and it's wonderful to have everybody here. I would like to call to open the 44th Annual Environmental Congress. Do I have a, a nomination for that? Move and a second? All in favor? Aye. Excellent. We're in business. So this morning, it's my pleasure to kick off the 44th Annual Environmental Congress leading with local action. But I am not a fool. So I realize and would like you to realize that this cannot be done without the volunteer effort, sweat, I don't think we have any blood this year, of uh, the ANJAC staff who I'd like to ask to rise and the ANJAC board for a, a party hand. I would also like to note that we have a great number of co-sponsors who are listed on the back of your program. I think we may have a record number this year who are also making today possible. We appreciate their, their support, their volunteer efforts, um, their tables of information at the exhibitors hall, which is placed, we, we've got exhibitor halls and exhibitor corners, so make sure you find yourself around today and, and uh, talk to the folks who are here because they're really experts in their field. And one of the things that we want to focus on is building connections between watershed groups and environmental organizations and municipal officials like you so that we can do our best to lead with local action. So that said, I'd like to kick off today, and I'm going to try to switch microphones here because I'm, I'm not good when I'm boxed in. I like to move around. So let's see. Is this working? Yes. Okay. I'll try not to get too emphatic and wave my arms around so you don't hear me. Uh, this is not the Congress I thought we were going to have when I stood here last year in front of you. And I say that because I thought that we would have opportunities to continue progress on some of the most pressing issues that are facing New Jersey, our country, and quite frankly, our planet. These are some of the headlines from just this week. Rollbacks in climate plans, suing oil companies for sea level rise, abandoning the bottled water ban in national parks, sewage flooding our cities that were hit by hurricanes. <coughs> so this plastic bottle ban, I realize, there's so many people who tell me things before I come here in the night lose some of it when I get in front of you because I'm so excited about the program. Um, one of the things I should mention is that we are committed to using less plastic and, and less materials overall. So when you have a conference, there's a, sometimes a little bit of a hiccup in communications. But we do now have a bin that is um, located near the, the eating area for composting the forks and the knives, um, which are made out of a corn-based material, so we'll make sure that they get composted. So if you can see to it to put your utensils in there, we would, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, one of the other things I should mention um, that we're benefiting from today is a Facebook Live. So if we all turn around and wave to the camera there, just so you all know that we're, we're on Facebook right now. Uh, but so these are some of the headlines of this week. Uh, climate climate change, plastic bottles, sewage overflowing, not the Congress I thought we were going to have, not the direction I thought we were going to continue to go. And if you're anything like me, and I, I think we do share a commitment and an ethic and a passion and sometimes an outrage for environmental issues, the news often feels like this to me. <laughs> <laughs> now this, this is from a movie, so no real people or buildings were harmed in this. <laughs> but it, it feels, it's that flood of overwhelmingness. And then, because I am at my core ultimately an optimist, and I think 
anybody who's committed to environmental causes or social justice causes has to be an optimist at the core. Sometimes we get a little cranky and we're cranky optimists, but we're optimists. After this feeling, then the outrage sets in and it feels a little like this. <laughs> so back in January, episode 01202017, the resistance started and we were planning science marches, climate marches, and we were vocalizing our outrage, and we were Facebooking, and we were tweeting, and there was more tweeting, and there was more tweeting on both sides. And now we're here today on 1013-2017. And we need to do more than tweet and Facebook and march. We still need to do those things. But we need to implement action. And so in January, you all received the NGAC report, and I know you, you wait for it, you read it cover to cover. I had said to you in my executive director's note, while we will undoubtedly see many attempts to undo environmental protections at the national level, we have an opportunity to make real progress here in the Garden State. And I said that to you in January, and I still believe it today. We are a strong home rule state, we have a lot of control at the local level to fight climate change, sea level rise, protect our habitats, improve where we stand with plastic pollution, uh, improve access to open spaces, preserve our farmlands, keep the garden in the garden state. And you have so much influence and control over that. However, achieving change does require changing your priorities. And we talk to you every year about setting priorities. And one of the things that we've put a lot of thought into at Anjac is looking at the 25% increase in requests for assistance this time over last year that we've received in the office. So you're, you're calling us more. There are some months where we have seen 100% increase in our website traffic because you, your municipal officials, your community are reaching to us saying, what do I do? What do I do at the local level? How do I affect change when we see so many things being rolled back nationally? Well, we have put together a set of priorities and we want to challenge you to think about your priorities starting right now, today, with whatever pen and paper you have in hand, whatever phone you're typing on right now, whatever laptop you have, start thinking about your priorities for 2018. What are the most pressing environmental issues in your community? What can your EC do about it? In order to affect change, you need a first step. You also need resources, and you may need assistance. We're here to help you. Here's what we think you can do, because we've seen it done in other places, and this is what we're prepared to help you with today. So leading through local action, you'll see that theme throughout the day, you'll see it through 2018. With regard to climate action, you've heard me say it before and I'll say it again until I'm blue in the face. I'm already starting to turn blue. The way New Jersey is experiencing climate change is through water. We either have too much of it, which we see through flooding and we'll hear about today, except for when we don't have enough of it, which we experience through drought. And we've seen that with three consecutive drought warnings, three years of consecutive drought warnings in a row. What can you do about that? In your community, you could help advance conversations on a water conservation ordinance. You could help advance conversations on protecting your stream corridors. You may have seen the news or you may have heard some of my Facebook outraging or some of your colleagues' Facebook outraging about the rollbacks and flood hazard protections that happened in New Jersey this year. Have I heard about that? Sound familiar? Couple of hands? Oh, good. So, um, thanks for the extra high rate. <laughs> uh, what the rollbacks and the flood hazard rules did in New Jersey was opened up our stream corridors for additional development. That places people and businesses in harm's way when the floods come. And so if your local rules reflected those state rules, you now effectively have had, have had a weakening of your stream protection buffers without perhaps even realizing it. You can take a renewable energy pledge, and there are many cities and communities who have done that. 
uh, greenhouse gas audit. There are alternatives, electric vehicle commitment. So we have a ride and drive today out in the parking lot. I encourage you to go check out some really cool electric vehicles. If I disappear for a while, I'll be in the Tesla driving around campus. <laughs> Solar siting ordinances. So there's a lot of stuff that I'm telling you. So anybody get a thumb drive when they came in? Yeah. You have the resources in your pocket. We've put this information on the thumb drive, how to take these actions. If that's not enough for you, you can call us, you can Facebook us, you can tweet us. I know some of you text me, that's not always the best way, but I'll take it. Some of the other, oh, there we go. Some of the other actions, plastic pollution. I already talked a little bit about this today. This is a very solvable problem that scares the bejesus out of me. The World Economic Forum says that by 2050, if we keep using plastics the way that we're using them, the ocean will be half plastic, half fish, pound for pound. So my niece is eight years old, and by 2050, she will be my age. I turned 41 yesterday. So by the time she's my age, the ocean will be half plastic, half fish, unless we do something. This is a sleeper problem, and it's very solvable, and it's done at the local level. So communicating with local restaurants about straw bans or alternatives, supporting uh, statewide legislation and local action on bags, bottles, bringing reusable containers, encouraging restaurants to encourage people to bring their own home reusable containers. These are all actions. They're in your pocket, you're on the thumb drive, you have it right now sitting with you on how to take action. So we're asking you to consider what actions can you take in your community in 2018 for climate change and plastic pollution? And what else? Go to blank slate. What else would you do in your community? What are the most pressing environmental issues? Write them down. Figure out your first steps. Figure out what resources you'll need. Come to us if you have questions. If we don't have the answers, We've got a lot of connections, and we'll, we'll put you in touch with who you need to be in touch with. Money helps. It's not everything, but it helps. Start thinking about your 2018 budget. What kind of projects do you want to implement? What kind of continuing projects do you need to maintenance? We certainly appreciate your ANJAC membership, and we're changing our structure next year so that there's one flat membership fee, and then you're able to access all of our workshops, all of our webinars, Congress is something a little bit special because it, there's an added cost, but all of those advertising workshops, webinars, trainings, conferences that you see, you can then access those through your, your regular AMBAC membership. You have a sample budget in an Excel sheet and a sample budget memo, memo on your thumb drive. If you're on a fiscal year for your budget in your municipality, so January to December, you should plan to have a sample budget in or an example budget into your municipality before Thanksgiving. You've already got the tools in your pocket. So that said, again, ANJAC is a resource for you. We have technical training guides, we have workshops, we have webinars, we have a small grants program. Call us. If we don't have the answers, we'll put you in touch with who you need to be in touch with. And I just want you to remember that <laughs> never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world because indeed it's the only thing that ever has. That said, I would now like to uh, recognize that we have a handful, a big handful, of Environmental Achievement Awards to present. We have some outstanding projects that we would like to recognize this year, and for that I would like to introduce Ann Jack's uh, board chair, Nancy Tindall, and um, one of our vice chairs, Ray Sawinski, to come up and uh, begin to present those awards. <coughs> thank you very much, and thank you, Jennifer. Uh, let, let me begin by saying, um, how much um, it means to have you all here today and uh, to be a part of this 44th uh, Congress. Um, as we think about the achievements that we're about to recognize, uh, it, they, they truly embody the uh, theme of, of today. 
And um, I hope you will all take an opportunity to congratulate um, those recognized for what they have achieved in their, in their uh, communities and how we can all learn from them, uh, how we can take this back to our own communities and be uh, the environmental stewards that we all aspire to be. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to uh, ask Bray to, to help here, uh, and we will um, begin our recognition of those who uh, are receiving this year's achievement awards. First up, we have the uh, Coldwell Environmental Commission. Coldwell Environmental Commission created pollinator pathways and monarch way stations at the Coldwell West Coldwell Schools, the Coldwell Library, a pocket park, a church, a convent, and the women's club. This effort benefited not only the bees, butterflies, and other pollinators, but school children and residents were able to learn about monarch butterflies, their dependence on milkweed, and the role that pollinators play in agriculture, as well as providing food and shelter for migratory insects. And accepting the award are Anne Marchioni and Jane Kinkle. Thank you. Thank alphabetical order by town. I gotta leave it up there for a couple of seconds at least. Second one is the Essex County Environmental Commission. The Essex County Environmental Commission has been holding a series of roundtables for environmental commissions throughout the county. The speakers cover a variety of topics including open space, urban forestry and tree ordinances, water wise communities, environmental grants for municipalities and finding funding, and alternative fuel vehicles in municipalities. Following the presentations, commissioners share their latest projects, successes and challenges, and offer up suggestions for further actions. And you'll excuse me, but some of the attendees, the list of attendees might be a little longer than what I just uh, read, but I don't know if they're all gonna come up, but I'm gonna now say words, their names. Gray Russell, Katrina Schaefer, Tara Casella, Dick Nick uh, D'Ambrosio, Jennifer Duckworth and Marchioni, second time, and Dawn Spango. I still want to know if I could bring my kayak on the lake here. Okay. Do you advance it for me, Dean? Do you advance it for me? Yeah. Next up, going a little further south, Jersey, Mount Holly Environmental Committee. The Detention Basin Naturalization Project. The Mount Holly Environmental Committee converted four local detention basins totaling about 2.2 acres into native meadows. The project allowed for increased water filtration to remove sediment and non-point source pollutants, restoration of water quality, restoration of native habitat for pollinators, improved aesthetics, and reduced maintenance requirements. 
Accepting the award is Randy Rothbaum. Environmental Commission for Parklet and Rapid Lounging Program. So this is something new. The South Orange Environmental Commission partnered with the South Orange Village Center Alliance to install a temporary parklet and a rapid lounging program. And what is a temporary parklet and rapid lounging program, you may ask? The parklet is a temporary reuse of two car parking spaces reimagined into a beautiful wooden parklet with native plants and flowers along with tables and chairs for commuters, shoppers, and passersby, a place to stop and enjoy the neighborhood. The rapid lounging program takes underused locations and temporarily turns them into lounging areas replete with Adirondack chairs, ottomans, and side tables. Both of these initiatives encourage more foot traffic and community. Accepting the award, Neil Chambers, Walter Clark. Do you have tableside service at those lounging areas? <laughs> Next year. Next up is the Washington Township Environmental Commission in Gloucester for community engagement. The Washington Township Environmental Commission undertook a suite of projects focused on increased community engagement. Instead of their usual Earth Day celebration in the park, they decided to switch to a month-long format of activities to celebrate Earth Month. They partner with the Open Space Advisory Committee, schools, the public library, and community groups for a series of events including gardening class, an art competition, community garden planting, a display of the environmental resource inventory, a rain barrel workshop, a, a reforestation project, a build a bird workshop, tree planting lessons, backyard habitat workshop, stream and lake sampling, and an owl presentation. Accepting the award, Vicki Benetti and Leon Lackritz. <laughs> try to do a little bit more next year, you know, try to become an overachiever. Okay? <laughs> The Waterford Township Environmental Commission for the Environmental T-Shirt Contest. The Waterford Township Environmental Commission held an environmental t-shirt contest in their schools to increase environmental awareness and participation in the two townwide cleanups which they held every year. Since instituting the t-shirt contest and accompanied by educational programs throughout the district, they have noticed an increase in the number of people participating in the cleanups. And accepting the awards are Dave Chittington and Terry Chittington. with the uh, school-aged children. I hope that um, it's a great basis for them to go further on as they become older. In the nonprofit category, Friends of the East Brunswick um, Environmental Commission's lecture series. The Friends of the East Brunswick Environmental Commission, along with the East Brunswick Environmental Commission and the East, and the East Brunswick Public Library, have developed a series of lectures dedicated to local environmental education and conservation. Topics have included hydroculture, salamander migration and protection, climate change, small space gardening, owls of New Jersey, green purchasing, and a rain barrel workshop. The Option Green series represents the Friends of East Brunswick Environmental Commissions and East Brunswick Public Library's commitment to environmental education and lifelong learning. Accepting the award is Melissa Hosick.
And again, for an honorable mention, Morris County Park Commission Connect to Walk program. The Morris County Park Commission, in collaboration with the Morris Park Alliance, Montclair State University, Trans Options, the Nomad Group, and others, conducted a survey and analysis to determine how to connect high need neighborhoods, schools, train stations, and bus stops to local park areas and businesses through the Connect to Walk program. The project resulted in a series of maps submitted to the Morristown Township Town Planner for use when planning future improvements. The initiative was funded by New Jersey Healthy Communities Network and the New Jersey Prevention Network. Accepting the award, Denise Lanza and Nick D'Ambrosio. Jeff Lovely. And Jeff Lovely. by size and age. <laughs> How about a hand for all our award winners? <laughs> and certainly for those that maybe didn't get the awards and that uh, want to do it again next year, we'll have awards next year hopefully. We're working on funding for that to continue this process. As uh, Jen has said, our requests keep on going up on a local level. So we keep on searching for funding opportunities to keep these grants uh, going so that we can provide them to you and start on the local level and work our way up. So again, congratulations to all. esteemed pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Mayor Dawn Zimmer. Mayor Dawn Zimmer became the first woman to serve as the mayor of, city, of the city of Hoboken in 2009. Prior to that, she served as a councilwoman after becoming involved in civic life as an advocate for park space. Mayor Zimmer led Hoboken through the difficult days of Superstorm Sandy, which is nearly five years ago at this time. She is implementing an integrated, comprehensive flood resiliency plan to protect from rising seas and stronger storms, and led the effort to secure $230 million for flood resiliency through the post-Sandy Rebuild by Design competition. Mayor Zimmer also secured funding to build a second flood pump, which has alleviated the flash flooding that frequently occurred during heavy rain events. She created and is implementing a green infrastructure strategic plan to address flooding, including rain gardens, bioswales, and new resiliency parks built with underground water detention basins. In partnership with the U.S. Department of Energy and Sandia National Labs, Mayor Zimmer is building the foundation for a microgrid to improve energy resiliency. She has been an outspoken advocate for changing federal and state regulations related to flood insurance, reconstruction funding, and building standards in order to meet the unique challenges and characteristics of our urban communities. Mayor Zimmer previously served on President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Re Rebuilding Task Force and Task Force on Climate Preparedness and Resiliency. It is a great pleasure to have her here today to learn from her experience and to share that with you. So I welcome Mayor Zimmer here today. So Jennifer, thank you so much for inviting me to be here with all of you. I'm incredibly honored to, to be here, and I just want to say up front, one, uh, to congratulate all of the uh, awardees today, and to thank each and every one of you. I know we have some um, mayors who are here with us, and um, you know all of you are really committed to the environment, which I think is so very, very important, and just really thank you for your work. And, you know, as we reflect on, you know, what happened in Texas, what happened in Florida, what's happening in Puerto Rico, the fires that are raging in California, 
I think that we need to work together as a state to not only meet the commitment for the Paris Climate Accords, but to go well beyond it. So your work is really helping us to move in that direction. So I thank you very, very much. Um, so I'm gonna sort of run through what Hoboken is doing to become as resilient and as sustainable as possible. And I'm looking forward, I hope you'll all think about questions that you have for me. I hope we have we should have some time for, for questions, and I think that sometimes is uh, sometimes the most productive way to really share um, the, the learning experience for everyone. So just to share a little bit about Hoboken, this is an image. We are a city um, of one square mile directly uh, across from New York City. I sometimes joke that we have the better view and enjoy New York more than others do. Um, so I invite you all to come. This is a Mumford & Sons concert that we had out on our waterfront. This is a view, another view of our waterfronts. We're very proud of, um, our, we treasure our waterfront, um, but it's also, we also recognize it. It's one of the challenges that we face as well. So we're a city uh, a little over one square mile with 53,000 residents, so we are one of the most densely populated uh, cities in the country. This is, uh, we have lots of, again, just want to put out the invite, you know, because I'm going to be showing you flooding images. So I, I want you to come to Hoboken and enjoy. We have arts and music festivals in the spring and in the fall, lots of events, uh, concerts on our waterfront um, throughout the spring and the summer and the fall. But we are also extremely vulnerable to flooding. So um, as this map shows, you know, when Sandy hit with a storm surge, the waters came in from the north and the south of our city, about 500 million gallons uh, came in. 80% of our city was underwater. Um, we also have had, I think, eight uh, or nine significant flood events since Sandy. So uh, we have a combined sewer system, and so we're, we are also susceptible to flash flooding. And obviously, we're extremely concerned about these rising sea levels and, and you know, the importance of moving ahead with reducing the impact of climate change to, uh, to reduce that. Um, so we're, we're watching that carefully and planning for it to make our city and our region as resilient as possible. And again, we're looking at the science. So you know, it's not just anecdotal. When it rains, it pours. And according to the National Climate Assessment Report, over the last 50 years, heavy rain events have increased by 71% in the Northeast. So we, we know it and we're experiencing it on a regular basis. So this is what it looked like during Sandy. 80% of our city was underwater like this. So these cars did not, did not park up. They, they just uh, all started floating in that direction and we had cars everywhere and um, severe flooding. So this is an image of our fire station. Three of our four fire stations were flooded during Sandy. Our Department of Public Works was underwater. Our all three substations were underwater. Our North Hudson Sewage Authority uh, treatment plant was underwater as well. That's my house, so there were a lot of homes that were underwater as well. So I, I take it very personally. I'm very committed to addressing this issue because I experienced it firsthand. So my family stayed um, at home during Sandy, I slept at City Hall because I did know I was, wasn't gonna be able to get back um, to my home. So yeah, we're, and I just wanna say a few words about how I guess I have advocated um, for changes to the National Flood Insurance Program and the way FEMA operates. They're very much focused on the individual. And if you look at this image, you look at the fire station. I mean, they, they, they would only give me funding to to flood protect the fire station, but as you can see from that image, just if that's flood protected, we're still not gonna be able to use it. We're still not gonna be able to keep the people of Hoboken safe just by protecting just around that individual fire station. We needed a comprehensive approach and I was trying to advocate with FEMA and with the state um, to take more of a comprehensive approach and, and had some ideas on that. So, um, and this is just another, just to show you the blue is where we were all underwater. Water again came in from the north and the south, and uh, those dots in the back, those are our substations that were all underwater um, for quite some time. So, needless to say, I was thrilled, and I really saw it as the last opportunity for Hoboken when uh, the Rebuild by Design competition was announced in 2013. And um, you know, that was a vision of Secretary, former Secretary Sean Donovan and Hank Ulvik, and you know, really appreciate President Obama supporting that, and I hope that one day we'll have Rebuild by Design competitions again at the federal level, and potentially it's something that the state 
could explore as well, because I think out of that process came an excellent um, result, and uh, you know, I, I hope that other communities will be able to benefit from this in the future. But out of the process, this was a process that we worked for uh, a year to get support from the community and to win the competition, but it's, a, it's really quite simple. It's a four-part water management strategy, so it involves from the north and the south, resisting the 500 million gallons of water that came in on us, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, and then delaying the stormwater from going down into the sewer system, so it builds on city projects that we were already working on, and then storing the water as much as possible, and then discharging that additional water. So that's a, a just in a, in a nutshell, that's what the process is. So resist, so it's not just about building a hideous wall, it's about building something that can have a dual purpose where it's, this is a, the concept um, in the north end of Hoboken is park as defense, so building something that's an amenity for the community that can build on the economic development uh, for our city but also protects. So the concept that came out of the process is a meandering pathway that would be the flood protection measure but built into that would be potentially basketball courts, a, a beach, so uh, I know and this is land that's owned by the city, so that's part of the, the concept for um, the placemaking at the northern end of Hoboken. And then another concept, that this builds on what we had already um, designed, is building a boathouse, um, and so again, underneath the water could, if we had a storm, the water could come in underneath and go back out, the flood protection measure would be built behind this, so it's something that you know, enables us to enjoy um, the, the Hudson River even more. It's the treasure of our city, but also to protect our community. And then we're also working very hard on dealing with the flash flood events. So again, Hoboken is a city, we have a combined sewer system. So the stormwater and the sewage are together. And when there's a high tide event, we, um, we have flood events. So since Sandy, again, we've had eight or nine serious flood events, so that brings that stormwater, that mix of stormwater and sewage up onto the city streets, and it leaves behind this disgusting sludge that's a, a health issue and a, you know, a quality of life issue, and you know, our fire department helps us with cleaning up. We bring in outside resources to help clean it up off the sidewalks, but it's a major challenge. And so we're, um, we're adding three uh, resiliency parks, and this is the first one that was just completed, so this is built with green infrastructure um, underneath, so it can hold back about 150,000 gallons of water. And it was done through, uh, we, we did have to use eminent domain to acquire this land. Um, we had a grant from the county, and then we have an open, the city of Hoboken has an open space trust fund, so we are bonding against that and using the revenue from the open space trust fund to, uh, to fund this. But we just opened the first, um, acre of this park, I'm working on acquiring a second acre, and then we've also passed a redevelopment plan which will make this potentially a, a three and a half um, to four acre park for our community. Um, but it's great, I mean there's, it's people actually, a resident just said to me the other day, wow I see butterflies, it's drawing everybody, it's drawing people, it's drawing nature, um, so we're really proud that that's um, in an environment where we, it was once a, a parking lot. Um, so that's just to show you underneath what you know what's what's happening. So the water is goes in through the bio swales and collects underneath, and then we're working with North Hudson Sewage Authority, where they have a sensor system that, at the right time, will release that water back into um, their system. So, so that's the first one. We're also doing a two-acre resiliency park that's under construction right now. This one will be able to hold back about four hundred and fifty thousand. Gallons. This one was achieved through a redevelopment agreement, so giving a certain amount of development in exchange for the two-acre park, uh, affordable housing for our community, and a public gymnasium that will open on, up onto this space. So that is um, expected to be done sometime next summer. Um, and we have recently acquired um, a six-acre parcel. Um, worked really hard to achieve this. This will be Hoboken's largest um, park once it's completed. And the concept is to build this with uh, a million gallon detention system. We are partnering again with North Hudson Sewage Authority. They are looking to separate the sewer system in the area. 
Uh, and then potentially that storm water could be pumped up to one of their outfalls, cleaned, um, and then pumped up to one of their stormwater outfalls and pumped out. So we're also going to be looking at ways to potentially reuse uh, you know, some of that water. So for example, we use water every day cleaning our city streets. Could we be collecting that water and using it to, uh, to clean the city streets or could it be used as gray water in some of the developments? So those are some of the concepts that will be explored. We've also created for right now, uh, this is, you know, this is cleaned up and capped. We've, we've done what we're calling a, a pop-up park. So if you come to Hoboken and go to Northwest Hoboken, you'll see this park. Um, so it has basketball courts and tennis courts and play area. And the, so the idea is that we wanted, you know, I felt like Hoboken really needs more open space and we didn't want to leave this sort of sitting out there as an empty lot until we completed the final park design and got the park built. So we're doing a pop-up park and part of the vision is that we use this pop-up park as a way to engage the community. So it's not just about having community meetings, it's also potentially getting out and reaching different people by going to the parks and engaging with them where they are with their children and getting their input and their, um, you know, making them a part of the process as well. Um, and so we're also, again, as much as we can reduce the amount of rainwater that's going into the sewer system, it will make a difference in reducing the flooding. So this is a city hall demonstration project. So we basically are, have, you know, disconnected all of the downspouts that go directly into the sewer system, connected them into a cistern system, and they provide the water for a rain garden that's all around city hall. So. Now eventually, I'd love to see Hoboken as a place that has, everyone either has a green roof on their building or they have some kind of a rain garden where their, their water is going into something and not just directly into the, the sewer system. Um, so we also, uh, we do do an, another pump. It is something that um, is just, it's the, the, for the emergency, you know, so the idea is to do as much as you can with green infrastructure and the, the Northwest Resiliency Park is a very important part of North Hudson's long-term control plan, but the pump is needed just for those emergency um, situations. It was, a, it was a challenge to get this one approved. This pump at 11th Street is between two luxury condos along the waterfront. That was really the only place that it would go, could go, but um, it was something that we worked with the community to try and address their safety um, concerns, um, but tried to really persuade them that this is something that, that had to get done in the best interest of, of Hoboken. Um, so, you know, this has been, you know, I have to say when we worked, we worked for almost a year to win the Rebuild by Design competition and I was thrilled, you know. I remember Juan is here with me and I, oh, I'm sorry, I should have introduced, this is Juan Melly right up front. He's my communications manager and, and policy person and worked really hand, um, hand in hand with me on so many of the projects that I'm talking about today. And I remember we were, we were just thrilled when we won. Uh, we were one of the winners and uh, you know, told that we'd won the $230 million um, project. And we thought, I thought, like, wow, we did it. <laughs> and little did I know, that was really just the very beginning. Um, so we had to go through what's called the NEPA process, and I call that sort of the legal hurdles. So as we went through the process for Rebuild by Design, we had to, we had to explore five different concepts, so some along the waterfront and some going inland um, and some so that several going on sort of inland as, as alternative options. And the community um, was very upset and very concerned and very concerned that this was all about just building hideous walls, potentially on our waterfront and going down residential streets. Um, so there was one meeting that we had that, um, you know, residents were just extremely upset and, and saying, calling on me to give back the money, don't do this project, stop. Um, and so we really, you know, there's a few things that we've done to, um, and it's an ongoing process. I mean, number one is, yes, we have, we've had a lot of community meetings. We created what's called an, a community advisory um, board that's made up of residents and business members. Um, and we, um, we had drop-in sessions. And then, you know, when this happened and there was a petition started, I went directly to people's homes and sort of talked to them and talked to them about trying to help them to understand, but also hearing them out and hearing their concerns. And for me, you know, it's been a learning process as well. And, you know, one of the big things that, that I learned through this process or that, you know, kind of solidified for me is that you have to really understand that every person comes to these 
challenges that we face from a different perspective. So in Hoboken, there are people that flooded, there are people that are terrified with every storm that we get, but then there are people that didn't flood and feel like, you know, you're gonna put this flood protection measure near my house, you could impact the property value of my home. And so you have to sort of listen to them and hear their input, just do extensive community outreach in every way possible, whether it's social media, community meetings, one-on-one, -on -one, engagement and um, so that's been how we've kind of over, overcome the challenges I mean so it, there was a point where I had a lot of my council members saying to me like wow it looks like this isn't going to be supported you should just pull this back and I felt like this is too important for Hoboken we've got to get this done we are at risk of another Sandy I can't say exactly when but we're totally at risk of another Sandy and we need to protect our community so I want to just show you um, this is the a flyover that we've done that gives you a little bit more of an understanding of what we're talking about with the uh, with the alignment. So hold on to your seats. <laughs> so we're going to fly in. This is a partnership with Weehawken and Jersey City. <coughs> So the alignment starts in Weehawken. And we really separate it out between placemaking and services. And so it's it's more so as we get to this park area, that's where we're we're focused on the placemaking. We'll be going through another year and a half of final design, but this is the conceptual design uh, that you're looking at. The city owns this land. Uh, we had already designed it as a park before Sandy, but then said we should we should pursue a dual purpose here. Um, and then it goes straight down um, a, uh, a, a street. And this is the gate. There's a series of gates that are in the alignment. These would obviously only be deployed when there is a uh, flood event. Um, and the whole concept is to design the flood protection measure as something that fits in with the urban landscape. It will have potentially a greenery. Um, so it will be something that will be, um, you know, this is potentially could be creating almost like a play area for the community. It goes down, this goes down an alleyway, and then it links into a commercial corridor. That was the, the feedback that we heard loud and clear from our community. I met with those two restaurant owners and explained, you know, this flood protection measure could provide additional outdoor space um, in front of your, your business, and they were supportive um, of that. And so now we're flying south, um, and the southern alignment, uh, you know, I'm advocating strongly for that to go um, around a, uh, a redevelopment plan that the city has um, completed, and I think we're, we're moving in that direction. But again, the water came in from the south and the north, so we need to protect, it needs to be a completed envelope, otherwise the system will not work. So this is just showing you the southern um, alignment, and it's near the train tracks, so it could be a green wall, could be designed as a green wall, could be designed with murals, uh, canopy, lighting, there's a lot of different designs that could be done, but this is right near, we'll, you know, we'll need to coordinate, and we are coordinating with New Jersey Transit, um, and obviously the, the state on this project. And so the next challenge we'll be figuring out, you know, what is that process when there actually is a storm when do you pull these gates across? How do you um, how do you manage all of that? So, but you know, for the next year and a half, we'll be going. The community will be going through a final design process, and this is uh, due to be built in uh, 2022. It's actually required to be built. Um, so they look to finish the the design process and get it constructed by 2022. So, yeah, I think the flyover kind of helps to give a, an overall. Um, more of, a, more of an understanding of what that alignment is, but it was a big process, bigger than I ever anticipated. I always thought we'd end up with something that was uh, all along the waterfront, and it turned out for us, we ended up in a place where the community consensus of not wanting it all along the waterfront and the funding level came together at exactly the same point, so we were lucky in that. Um, and we're also just to, you know, we're, we're working, you know, to make Hoboken as sustainable as possible. So through our redevelopment process, we're requiring green works, we're re requiring higher levels of um, energy efficiency and, and rain gardens. And we've been very successful with legislation. We made it so that if you, um, if you add a green roof to your building, you can have some space for um, a deck. And we made it 
possible to go through the planning board for that rather than through the zoning board. And we've added 100,000 square feet of green roof since we made that legislative um, change. And we've also, uh, we passed a flood protection measure after um, Sandy and developed um, flood resiliency design guidelines. So the challenge in our city is that so many, um, there's garden level apartments and those were all flooded and they are at risk. So basically we want to preserve the character of our city. So we made it so that in the future you can have commercial uh, development, but we're not going to allow uh, residents to be on the ground floor um, anymore. And so, um, well, I mean, it's, it's grandfathered in. So if you already live there, you're not, you're not moving. But if there's new development that's happening, uh, you can't have residential on the, the ground floor. Um, and I also just want to mention social resiliency. So I, I really believe that every community should have a community emergency response team. So I just want to mention that this team, you know, I, I started it up when I came into office. And during Sandy, during Irene, during Sandy, they were the backbone of the rescue effort. Um, you can't expect your police and fire department to do everything, and they were part of, you know, we had what we call a pod system where we had, um, you know, places where food was delivered throughout the city. They were helping to coordinate the volunteers, delivering food. We set up a system to deliver medicine um, to our seniors, and they play an important role uh, continuing to help Hoboken residents to, you know, to educate them. They're out at all of our festivals really trying to help them think about how can you be yourself um, resilient and prepared for the next storm. So can't emphasize it enough. Um, having a CERT team is really, I think, great for every community and our police and, and fire department really appreciate it. You know, when there's an emergency, they're, they're the call center. They take in the calls and obviously, if, if it's an emergency, the people call the police, but it cuts down on the amount of people just calling the police to get information. You can get the information from our CERT team. Um, so just moving into energy resiliency, I mean, I have to say, you know, that was one of the toughest things is, you know, we had no power. We had no power um, for, you know, in some parts of Hoboken, two to three weeks. Um, so we were, you know, the, our way of communicating with the public was doing, I did a press conference, I think for about 10 days, uh, kind of a briefing for the community um, every day at two o'clock, uh, no matter what, what else was on the schedule, I'm trying to talk to everyone. We also had a system of, of putting up notices on, um, you know, having volunteers go out and put up notices. It was amazing to see like the, the rumors that would start and, you know, we just had to constantly sort of putting out fires of, you know, no, the water is safe, it's okay, you know, like kind of reassuring the community. And so there was annually putting out notices, just old fashioned way, piece of paper and, and posting it. Um, so I'm really proud that we're working on, you know, energy, Resiliency. I mean that that experience of of trying to help the community through not having power has really you know brought home to me how important the energy is. And I, I can't tell you like I remember having this one experience of going around and delivering food during Sandy and having a senior literally cry in my arms, just saying like they left us with no lights. I can't even get up or down. There's not even a hallway light to um, to get in or out. And so. You know, just I think it's extremely important. So I'm proud that we're working with PSE and G. Um, we own land. Uh, we're doing a land swap agreement with them to combine our two substations and elevate them. And working to design it as something that fits in with the urban landscape um, of our community. We've also worked to make our um, our backup generators not just have a backup generator. We have permanent, permanently installed um, generators uh, with natural gas. I mean that was other. Another major challenge was, you know, you find out that the gas, you know, we, we were running out of fuel. We, we needed fuel for making sure that our police cars could drive around, that our fire trucks could operate, that our fire station, uh, our one operating fire station and our police department and city hall where we had our operations center could all operate. So I'm proud that we've got backup generators that are critical um, assets that are permanently there and um, tested on a regular basis. And we're moving towards um, doing a microgrid. Um, so again, that, that experience that I had with that senior, I think, has really driven home for me the importance of trying to protect the community. And so we've been working uh, with Sandia National Labs um, and uh, to design, and uh, the state BPO to design a microgrid. And we're making our own investment as well. So we're doing a major um, upgrade of Washington Street, and we put in uh, the uh, fiber to uh, support a microgrid. And the idea is that that 
would connect in to our fire station, to our police station, to North Hudson sewage authorities, um, backup generator, we can't have that pump go down. Um, and it would provide the foundation for more renewable, doing more solar, um, and it provides a, a layer of, of real redundancy for our community and keeping our community safe. So I think this is the, um, I'm just gonna show you this video that was, that Pew did for us that I think provides kind of an overview of the value of the microgrids. city like a bathtub, 80% of the city was underwater, so our electrical substations were underwater, which meant the power was out in most of the city. Several adult communities didn't have power, pharmacies didn't have power, fire and emergency services were challenged to dispatch correctly and take incoming calls for help, so it was a true dark age type environment in Hoboken during Hurricane Sandy and in the, in the week or two following. When you have 50,000 people in one mile, and all hell breaks loose, it truly is a frightening situation. So it was scary. My major concern was making sure that everyone was safe. Well, it was really our public safety team, our CERT team, and a little bit of luck that kept everyone safe in, in Hoboken, and I'm extremely thankful for that. I am a firm proponent of sheltering in place. If people are prepared, they can shelter safely in their homes. And so we're trying to get people to personally be prepared, um, but also advocating for a microgrid which could support our sheltering in place uh, approach. So a microgrid is a control system, it's an insurance policy in effect. So in the event of an outage, a microgrid will identify and balance all of the energy generation assets versus the critical loads. So in cities like Hoboken, some of the critical loads might be a police, a fire station, a hospital, and our control system acts to provide power then to those assets when the larger utility grid is down. The electric system here is old. And in New Jersey, we have a great system, but over time, these systems are stressed because we have a lot of people. And so this microgrid is going to be able to do two things. It's designed to make this place more resilient, not just from storms, but from day-to-day -day energy peaks, from continued growth. It will give freedom to Hoboken to also have more alternatives when it comes to energy. Hoboken enlisted Sandia National Labs to do a study and that study effectively identified what were the critical assets in the city and then what happened during Superstorm Sandy. We were really lucky that the Department of Energy and the Sandia National Labs worked with us. They came in and really did the analysis and, and helped us to um, design a microgrid. We're proposing about 55 buildings that includes the hospital and the supermarket and obviously our public safety facilities, our police department, our fire department. The city will have the role in owning the microgrid but it may very well be a private company that manages it. It can't all happen with private sector dollars. It cannot all happen with the city of Hoboken saying we're gonna bond for it. But you know, if you can have some coming from the federal government, some coming from the state, some coming from the private sector, you put it all together and you can make it happen. It's been really exciting to see the energy from the citizens when they come out for public meetings and educational meetings to talk about microgrid. And in the city, their citizens, they've responded and it was just open arms. Hoboken is, uh, we're right across the river from New York City and we're a community, it's one square mile. It's a very diverse community and a community that really, uh, you know, especially through Superstorm Sandy, we really came together. We love our waterfront, it's the treasure of our city, but it also is a risk that we face. And so we are always looking for ways that we can be more resilient for the future. And having a microgrid is definitely uh, an important part of that. <laughs> Another area that we're working on, uh, in addition to uh, the energy resiliency, is, is thinking about transportation resiliency. And so I am really proud that we have um, implemented um, a bike share program in Hoboken that now has 20,000 members. I think that's pretty impressive. We have 53,000 residents and 20,000 
um, members. Um, so we've had over 300,000 rides, and the concept behind this is that every Hoboken resident is within a five minute walking distance of a bike share station. And this is really the next generation in bike share. Um, the GPS is within the bike, so it's a lot more convenient. So when people bring their bike, you know, there's a lot of people, you'll see it's almost like the breathing of Hoboken. They are going to the path, they're going to the ferry, um, and they don't have to worry about if there's too many bikes. They can leave the bike. It's, it doesn't have to be going to the docking station. And this system is, all, is also much cheaper. It's about $1,200 per bike as opposed to $6,000 dollars per bike that the New York City City Bike System is. So I'm very proud that we have that. You know, it just creates another convenient way for people to get around Hoboken, not have to be in their cars. We also have a car sharing program that is extremely uh, successful as well. And again, the cars are all located on the streets within a five minute walking distance of every Hoboken resident. And we're, uh, you know, we're challenged with that right now. We really probably need to expand it because the usage of the cars is over 50%. So it's really being used and you know, I've talked to so many residents who say, yeah, it's great. I was able to you know, give up my second car, not buy a second car, or we have you know, young people moving to Hoboken who say, yeah, it's great. I'm, I don't have to buy a car. I don't have to have that expense of you know, insurance and, and um, you know, where I'm gonna park my car. So um, yes, yeah, so we're getting, you know, by using other you know, alternative modes of transportation, whether it's car sharing, bike share. We also started a hop shuttle system that goes all around the city. Um, and so we're creating different ways for people to get around and trying to get people um, out of their cars as much as possible. While still recognizing there are some people that need to drive every day and drive to, to work. So we're trying to make it easier for them as well. So you know, just in, in closing, I mean, I think, you know, as I think about some of the challenges, I think that the funding you know, it's, it's difficult to focus um, attention on and invest in a problem that's not visible and immediate. So, I mean, for Hoboken, we, we took the sandy devastation that we experienced and turned it into an opportunity. And um, so I think for communities that maybe haven't been hit by a major storm, not that we don't, we don't want that to happen at all, but I think it is more, more challenging to get residents to understand that you have to be preparing um, for the future, um, but for us, we really worked hard to uh, to, to turn what was a dev was devastating for our community really into um, an opportunity, and I think that's part of the way we were able to get support um, from the community and, and from the city council. But I think the challenge is that, that there's there's not really a positive um, reinforcement for proactive good governance and investment in infrastructure. So. You know, nobody's really talking about, you don't see the press doing a story and I'm like, hey, that bridge looks really good and they've done that. Uh, that maintenance and the investment in that bridge and, and for us, like we have, we put in the pump um, and, and so it's hard for people to really see, you know, this is in 2011 and this is in 2017, that pump is making a difference, but it's underground and people are obviously happy that it's not flooding, but they don't always understand um, what that, the value of, of that investment. You know, and I think that, you know, the, another challenge is that people do have a short memory. It's now five years since Sandy, and there are new people moving to Hoboken, and, um, you know, a lot of people aren't aware of Rebuild by Design, may not understand why it needs to be done. So the next year and a half is still going to be a challenge trying to finalize the design um, and, and get it built and have people continue to understand that it is a risk. So my hope for Hoboken is that we get this built by 2022 before another major storm hits our region and that we can be a model for how you can protect and, you know, because sadly, like, all it will take is one storm to show that this is, this is in the black. We will have saved money by doing this project in this way. Um, and, I, you know, lastly, it's, it's just, it's a challenge to, you know, it's a complicated issues, it's complicated for people to understand uh, the, the solutions, the proposed solutions, and, you know, I think that's just an ongoing process, and, you know, my, my advice to uh, you know to everyone working on these kinds of projects, you just you know if at first you don't succeed, you got to try a different route and and try to uh, engage in, in a different way. So um, you know again, it's really been an honor to uh, to be here and kind of share what's happened in Hoboken and how we're trying to make our city as resilient and sustainable as possible moving forward. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you.
this working? Great. Oh, hey Amanda, how are you? <laughs> and then, how about this one? Yeah. All right. Mayor, sir, what measures do you have on Let's do on the mic because we are Facebook live -ing. so for Facebook. What, what measures do you have uh, on steps that you've already taken relative to storms that have happened since then in terms of effectiveness? Um, yeah, I mean, so we have, again, we've, we've worked with the community to do the flood prevention ordinance to help, um, you know, individual homeowners make their, raise up their utilities, and we've put in the flood pump and that. We've definitely seen a dramatic difference in that, and we've got one resiliency park um, built. So we've really been working to, you know, to secure the funding, so for Rebuild by Design, securing the $230 million, and we're, we're very close to uh, seeing the release of those funds. So we've got a lot in place that, you know, if, if we can get it done within the next couple of years, Hoboken and, and the region will be um, much more protected. Yeah, I don't quite understand the microgrids. What's the power source for these microgrids? So for right now, I mean, the power source, it, it basically provides a platform to connect. So we've got a, a natural gas generator at our police department, at our fire station. North Hudson Sewage Authority has a, um, they've got a backup generator. So the idea is through that platform to connect all of them. You can also connect in more of the renewables, doing more solar. So it provides an additional level of security because so say for example, the backup generator for North Hudson Sewage Authority goes down, which it came close to during Sandy because it almost got flooded. So if that pump had gone out, we would have been underwater for three weeks. So we need to make sure it provides a, so if that their backup system goes out, it's all connected through the microgrid. So the power from the natural gas could be, or from solar or whatever, could be providing power to, to them as well. So for right now, it's, it's gonna be natural gas, uh, the, the backup tying in the, the natural gas backup generators, but the vision is to incorporate, have more solar and incorporate that as well. So the focus so, is for a high priority uh, needs? Well, so the focus is for, yes, it's a number of things. So it's for high priority needs to make sure that through a storm uh, we can be operating and keep our community safe. It's to you know provide a, an additional level of redundancy this will also operate um, during peak uh, demand. So in the summer, when everyone's got their air conditioning on, it will provide um, energy back to PSC and G. So it reduces the investments that they would need to make in you know additional um, energy sources. So it also provides. It helps. You know that's a that's a longer term um, vision and getting it getting it done. But that's also part of the benefit of it. So uh, this is Councilman Len Resto from Chatham Borough. Um, I think you've been a transformative mayor. Uh, it, you know, this is really great stuff uh, to hear. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping that it's successful. You mentioned uh, NJ Transit, but I didn't hear that the Port Authority might be taking part in this as well because of path floods and NJ Transit, as we know, was knocked out of commission by Sandy. So I would wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, so the port, of, I mean, there was, uh, you know, that was one of the designs that we explored was to uh, protect the path uh, with a, a, an alignment that would have been in the water and protecting the ent entire transit um, area, but it was just not economically feasible. Um, so the way that Port Authority is proceeding, they are, they have actually, a, a, they have a system now that they can install if the storm is, Coming um, and they are actually we just met with them and they have a, you know a kind of a longer term plan to basically almost put like submarine doors will be installed and the path area will become almost like a submarine and literally doors will close up and it will just be um, tightly uh, secured from from water going in so there is a plan for the port authority as well um, you know but uh, because of you know some of the the financial challenges I mean I. You know, two hundred thirty million dollars is is we feel tremendously uh, you know um, pleased to to get to win that award, but it's still it's not it would cost probably a billion dollars to do the design that was you know explored as a possibility. So um, Port Authority is moving ahead in a different way to protect the path, but they do indeed have 
a way to protect the path now and a longer term strategy that will be even more resilient. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's an inspiring story. I wonder if other municipalities have reached out to learn about what you're doing. Um, I, th I mean, I've been asked to speak at conferences, and um, you know, and I think that, but there, there hasn't been. I don't know, Wendy. I mean, there hasn't been a. There's been people that have reached out to to understand like what we're doing with bike share, what we're doing with car share, what we're doing with our. So there is starting to be more of an interest um, in communities wanting to reach out and understand what we're doing. Um, you know, with our resiliency parks, and so we've given. You know, there's been various conferences that have come through. Um, and uh, for example, the uh, 100 really Resilient Cities, when they had a big conference in New York, they came and took a bike tour of Hoboken and we showed them you know, all of the resiliency efforts that were, are underway. So yes, there are other communities reaching out to understand what we're doing. Mayor, you uh, mentioned uh, Hoboken, uh, sorry, Weehawken and Jersey City. I mean, no, no community, especially in one square mile, is an island. Uh, what are the communities around you doing to build on the success that you are creating here, protect themselves, and frankly, you can't protect yourself without them. So how, what are they doing to build on this? Right, so this project um, extends into Weehawken. So the area of Weehawken that was flooded is called the Shades. Um, and so we really share that kind of the path of the water was through the Shades in Weehawken and through Hoboken going back to a critical asset that we share, which is North Hudson Sewage Authority that provides uh, sanitation services for five communities in, in Hudson County. And so the alignment will protect uh, the part of Weehawken that flooded, and the alignment will protect um, a part of Jersey City as well. So there are a lot of residents in, in Jersey City, and so it will also protect on the, the southern border as well. So it goes into Jersey City as well. So. So uh, Weehawken and uh, Jersey City have been a part of this process and I've been working with Mayor Turner and um, Mayor Fulop. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's been because the alignment, a large portion of the alignment is within Hoboken and it's also um, much closer to residential areas. It's been you know, more of a challenge within Hoboken, but it's, it's, this is a plan that includes Weehawken and Jersey City. Um, I want to just uh, thank you. But uh, my name is uh, Michael. Paul Merrick from Bloomfield. I'm an environmental commission member, planning board member, and I guess my question is, you've been using both the words resiliency and sustainability, and um, if you could possibly tell me, I know the two are not mutually exclusive, but they're also not identical. Can you explain how you differentiated that in your conversations with both the community and public officials um, that you've worked with on the project? Yeah, I mean, I think of resiliency as, as um, doing the, the building so that or doing projects that will help to help our community to not only uh, survive and, and move through a storm but also recover more quickly so those are you know sort of rebuild by design um, is an example of being more resilient into the future um, and and sustainability I think of is more on the like trying to reduce the impact of climate change so what we're doing with bike share, what we're doing with green roofs, what we're doing uh, with higher standards on development, I think of that as, as more um, sustainability and trying to reduce the impact of climate change. I apologize, but this will have to be our last question. It's in the back. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. A question that occurs is that the environmental uh, problems that you talk about are not exclusive to uh, Hoboken, and are any of the cities from around the world that have had similar problems, uh, have their solutions contributed to what you're doing? Well, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the solution, you know, the, what I thought was great about Rebuild by Design, it builds on some of the things that the city was doing. Um, but the kind of comprehensive strategy, this was led by OMA, it's a Dutch um, firm, and so we're really learning from um, the Dutch, so that's, I would say, is kind of probably the biggest influence on this project, and um, yeah, so we're, there's always more to learn from other communities, but we've definitely been influenced by the Dutch and, and their approach to water. All right, so thank you very much.
some incredible workshops for you, so I invite you to, to go and join those. Uh, a tasty lunch, and during lunch we also have the ride and drive for the electric cars. So uh, I hope you'll partake in that as well. And then I will see you back here at whatever time you're scheduled.